Welcome to VLGA Connect. My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is when you choose to watch, and we know many of you do, the VLGA Connect Governance Update, which is brought to you by Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Firstly, a brief announcement before we get into the news of the week. It is sad to report that, unfortunately, I won't get to have my weekly dose of Stephen Cooper, and nor will you for, for some time, because Steve has needed to take a break indefinitely for family reasons, and we send him our best wishes, of course, and hope at some point in the not-too-distant future he'll be back with us. And to fill the breach, we, we're going to have some guest hosts in the coming weeks, and none better than this week's from Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. I'm delighted to say hello and welcome to Tony Ralich. Hi, Tony. Good day, Chris, and good day, viewers. And look, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a pale imitation of uh, good old Steve Cooper, but I'll do my very best. Um, we've got some things in common, Steve and I. He'll be shaking um, <laughs> when he hears that, and you won't get invited to any dinner parties being compared to me. But um, we're both country <laughs> boys, like like you, Chris. Yes, you know? yes. We all start somewhere, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Great metropolis of Ballarat and uh, Swan Hill, Chris, and I think you're Shepparton. Shepparton, Shepparton Cobram, that that area, yes. But yeah, we so all there you go. love local government, don't we? We're, that's what brings us together. We're strange. Um, Tragics is the, I think it's tragics. become the official term. A local say, aficionados, but yeah, tragic. <laughs> um, on the pale thing, Tony, hopefully we'll get some sunshine soon. You'll be able to do something about that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, we've got uh, quite a bit of news to get through, and I'm really keen to get your thoughts on some of these, uh, Tony, because some of them this week have a legal aspect or implication. And uh, we mentioned uh, last week the uh, the issues that have been happening in Darabin City Council. They were back in the news again this week because the Labor Party took the council to court over the removal of election signage. And I think uh, there's been a settlement reached in this case Tony? It, it has. So, yes, this was um, an interesting case, a Supreme Court case, um, but the settlement concluded on Wednesday, I think, of this week. But, yes, um, so the ALP had, had taken Darabin Council to court about the removal of certain signs in the um, state seat of Northcote in that campaign. I think Kat Theophanis is the candidate there yes. for the ALP. Um, of course, in the background was this sense that, you know, that's a a Greens um, dominated council. Um, the um, the allegation was that the signs had been moved illegally and uh, I think destroyed. Um, as we know, um, signs on private land, and these were signs on private land, that's governed right. by the planning scheme. Yeah. And, and that's common across Victoria. It's in the state planning provisions. Um, the clause 5205 um, has particular provisions um, about signage and, and when permits are required. And there are various exceptions, um, you know, a, a sign outside a church indicating hours of worship, mm. you know, a sign sell, uh, in relation to sale of a private residence, etc. One of the exceptions is um, around political signage. Yeah. And of course, there was a big case uh, at the start of the year um with the, the federal election wasn't it correct yeah. i mean familiar territory here because who yeah. would have thought that we'd be um having a furor about signage in an election yeah. <laughs> this in council elections often and of course yeah. federally but in the seat of goldstein um the campaign um by uh, so the zoe daniels campaign was faced with a challenge um was a matter of uh, bayside council versus badger and um, the decision um, ultimately um, was that um, provided that the signs don't stay on private land for more than three months and provided that they're removed within 14 days of the election and that they meet the other requirements in the scheme about, you know, um, how big they are and not being internally illuminated mm. and such, they don't need a planning permit. Mm. However, going back to the Darabin case, 
the city of Darabin said, we removed those signs because they'd been graffitied and there was offensive ah. language. Okay. Right. But um, after all of that, the settlement's been reached that uh, whereby the, um, the council has agreed they won't remove further signs that the ALP have up in that seat. Um, and in turn, the ALP has agreed that if signs are graffitied with offensive language, then they'll um, remove um, that language within 24 hours of being notified. So it's a good, interesting reminder. Um, planning scheme controls signage on private land. Yes. So political signage on council owned land would be governed by the council bylaws and typically um, would be prohibited under the yeah. council bylaws. Yeah. Interesting outcome there, and uh, it was it was also interesting to note the commentary in some of the press and some of the obviously it's it's taken on a political tone because we're in the the last throes of a of a state election, um, but the suggestion that the signs were being removed because the council was dominated in some way by Greens councillors that was strongly refu refuted by the Greens and by the council spokespeople who rightly say you know council laws sitting around the council table don't make decisions about the enforcement of local laws it's an officer-led function absolutely very much in the domain of the officers an operational um, matter and we we often urge councillors not to get involved in enforcement matters it's um it's certainly not in their sort of purview yes absolutely all right. Thanks for the update on that. Uh, another council has been in court and unfortunately Moira Shire has been making the news a bit for a few reasons of late. Um, and there's a court action from an employee around uh, allegations of illegal dumping of toxic waste and uh, retribution for speaking up about that matter. Now, I don't think we need to say too much about this case, the case because it's before the court, but it is in the public realm, Tony, that the matter is on foot. It, it is. Um, I do act for Moira Council on a number of matters, not this particular matter, mm. but um, certainly the the. Uh, it's suffice to say the article does quote um, a a spokesperson for the council who says in turn that the um, the council say it's not appropriate to comment either while it's before the federal court, but they do say that the council's position is that they always comply with um, relevant EPA standards, so that'll be no doubt the subject of um, consideration in that court case that we'll watch um, with anticipation. We will also, given the fact that there's a commission of inquiry underway, and I know that's something you can't uh, comment on too much, Tony, um, but also as an aside, uh, there's two vacancies on that council and the VEC has scheduled the countbacks. The first is coming up on the 6th of December, which is Monday week, I think, or Tuesday week as we uh, record this. And the uh, the second will be the following Monday, the 12th of December. And of course, we'll talk about the results of those when they come to hand. Now, talking about elections, uh, back to mayoral elections, uh, I did have someone from overseas, Tony, say to me uh, this week, they're very confused about all these mayoral election updates. And um, it, it seems a bit odd to them how we go through this period here in uh, in. Victoria. Victoria, uh, we've had a number of results come out uh, this week as council laws make decisions about their leadership team for the forthcoming 12 months in most cases. I'll throw a few of these at you for comment because I know uh, I know you've got a strong connection with Nilambic Shire, Tony. They've elected their youngest mayor ever in Ben Ramcharan, who is 26 years of age. I'm just wondering, who was the youngest mayor of Nilambic before Ben? Would you happen to know that? I reckon I've got a pretty good run there actually as one of the youngest mayors i think it might have even been me but i what i was i was amused because somebody sent me the twitter feed and congratulations to ben but um there was the um not the wall of shame but the wall of of, of mayors behind and i i did count and think well it's only so many more mayors and i'll be relegated to a back room <laughs> soon uh so uh, seriously how old were you when you were mayor of nillenbeck tony that's a good question. I think I was 28. Well, you've been pipped at the post effectively <laughs> by uh, by young Ben. Uh, good on you, Ben. We've had I've had a few dealings with uh, Ben and wish him uh, well in the role. Uh, Jeff Payne is the uh, the new deputy mayor there at uh, Nillambic. Um, uh, new mayor up at Indigo in Sophie Price. Congratulations to uh, Sophie. I think uh, Sophie's been elected for a two-year term. We're, we're seeing a small number of two-year terms. Uh, Tony, I'm not sure if you've noticed around the state, but, but not a lot. 
Yeah, unanimous vote for Sophie. Congratulations to her. Um, the beach wear for other Glen, beautiful indigo. Yeah. Yes, absolutely right. Uh, and Bernie Gaffney, who's been the mayor for for a couple of years, I think, um, who took over from Jenny O'Connor, um, uh, has stepped down to the the deputy mayor role. So he'll be providing uh, some guiding support. Ruth Gastrain at Karangamite, sixth term as mayor. Congratulations to Ruth. Well done. And again, real, real stalwart of like a government, Ruth. Yeah, absolutely. And Jim McGee's been re-elected this week at Glen Ira as the mayor. Uh, Tony, I wanted to note a couple of deferrals of mayoral elections. One of these in particular, I want to get your thoughts on. So uh, Borundara had uh, three attempts in one meeting to elect a mayor, uh, could not achieve an absolute uh, majority, uh, has deferred that for another attempt on the 8th of December. Uh, Latrobe deferred their mayoral election. Uh, they've got some councillors running in the state election. I think they've uh, they had issues with getting the numbers as well, so they've deferred until after the uh, to, after the election. And uh, Wodonga, uh, interesting case at Wodonga. This is one I wanted to get your thoughts on, Tony. They had a three three vote for mayor, couldn't be split, no absolute majority. There's a vacancy on the council. Countback coming up the, the same day as the first Moira countback, actually on the sixth of December. Um, they've deferred it to a date no later than the 16th of January in their resolution. And I wondered how that sat with uh, the act, which seems to require mayoral elections to be carried out by around that first week of December. Yeah, well, well, it's 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 not prescriptive as in a day, but but certainly Section 26 of, I think it is, Section 26 of the Local Government Act um, talks about the necessity of the mayoral election being as close as reasonably practicable to the um to the anniversary of either the one year or the two year term ah, okay. of the mayor. And so the question being, you know, is 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 you know a deferral to mid-January as close as reasonably practicable. And to me it would you know turn on circumstances. Um yeah. I think you know certainly what's occurred in Burundara, they've made an attempt, they've um they're they're doing the another making another attempt at the next date that's available for a um, a council meeting. Um, I can imagine circumstances where a much longer delay would be uh, reasonable, um, you know, a natural disaster yeah, in the council, yeah. for example, or something like that. Um, but yeah, this this that's an interesting one in terms of uh, a, a delay all the way into mid-January. Um, and it, yeah. it'll be interesting to think what um, attitude um, you know, the local government department might take to that. Yeah, clearly the intention is to to get through the countback procedure and get the new mm -hmm. councillor on board uh, mm -hmm. and thereby uh, break a 3-3 deadlock. Um, and, so and is that one of the circumstances you think? Yeah, that, and, and yeah. so, and again, the Act's not, not um, just, you know, descriptive about this or explicit, but mm -hmm. but there's a, there's a rationale there that seems quite logical. Um, they've made the attempts... Uh, now they haven't initially said no. We're not even going to make an attempt until that countback occurs. So, so um, I think it's probably defensible. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very interesting. Now, the uh, local government inspectorate has released their spring newsletter. There's lots of reading in this. Recommend this to people to have a look through. I know a couple of things caught your eye. Tony, but particularly we wanted to note the uh, the contribution to the sector of Ross Millard, who's retiring after uh, a number of significant roles around the local government sector over the years. Oh, absolutely. Ross has uh, been a doyen in local government for, for 25 plus years, I, I guess. And uh, the last, I think, 13 or so um, with Michael Stepanovic and, and the, the, the uh, local government inspectorate um, team. Um, but prior to that, um, you know, Ross has had some really significant um, contributions at really important stages in local government, including um, way back in the, you know, the Jeff Kennedy era, where Ross was, you know, a part, essential to some of those decisions around moving from the 210 councils that we had yes. back then to the 78 or 79 as it became. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a really, you know, watershed sort of era for local government. Um, and I think Ross has also been um, really integral to, you know, introduction of more, um, more business-like um, managerial standards into mm. um, accountancy in local government, um, a big sort of uh, part of that. So congrats to Ross and hope you enjoy uh, a well-deserved retirement. 
Absolutely. Couldn't uh, couldn't have said that better. I echo those thoughts. You mentioned the 210 coming down to 78 mm. and then 79. So a little trivia question there for our local government tragics. Uh, what were the circumstances for 78 to become 79? You'd remember, of course, Tony. Well, well, I I, I do remember, but um, shall we do, do we put an answer in the um in our in our feed? How will we do this? <laughs> let's let's come back to it. I know you won't be on the show next week, but maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll yeah. see who's first to put some answers in the social media feeds right. or the YouTube comments, yeah. and then we can note who was the first to uh, to identify awesome, that. Next week. Really significant prize from the sponsors, which is um, your name gets mentioned next week. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't do any better than that. Uh, get ready to be inundated. All right. Uh, also, that newsletter talks about a couple of cases that we've talked about here on the governance update in uh, in recent weeks, but uh, pays to remind councillors in particular about personal interest return requirements, Tony. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the, um, the inspectorate um, did mention that they'd actually issued some written warnings to particular councillors for a failure to um, provide sufficient detail, be sufficiently candid in their personal interest returns. Of course, councillors and council staff um, are required to um, put these returns in. Councillors, I think, within um, 30 days of an election and then biannually um, yes. throughout you know, each year. And uh, just a good reminder for councillors to keep those returns up to date. Don't assume that you know, last year's return will suffice if things have changed and um, make sure that um, this, it, it's a full disclosure of mm. the relevant um, interests. I, I was really interested to read that um, a couple of those cases, I think at least one, maybe two, um, were where councillors had provided their information to the CEO separately to the form and then noted on the form provided to the CEO, which doesn't meet the requirements, does it? Well, well clearly um, the reason to put these returns in is some, some transparency um, and, and to allow the public to see not only that we are um, disclosing those interests so that we we, we, we can um, be aware of potential conflicts of interest, but that, you know, demonstrating that in a transparent way that the public can see that being done and that yeah. requires, you know, the, the um, assets to be listed or the interests to be listed in return. So check all of that out. There's quite a bit of reading in the spring newsletter uh, from the local government inspectorate. If you're not on the uh, mailing list, uh, I don't think it's too hard to get on it. I'm sure you can find the information on the uh, on the website. I've got a few local government stories from beyond our borders to run by you, Tony, in a second, but I just wanted to note and congratulate the team at Greater Bendigo City Council and the Art Gallery there. We've had some figures released this week on the contribution of their Elvis exhibition to the economy. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, I know it was really difficult towards the later stages to get in. I think it was a sold-out exhibition. $67 million contribution to the local economy, according to state government figures, and another 22 million on top of that for the state economy. That's pretty extraordinary for a regional centre to really punch above its weight in that way. Can I, can I say I'm all shook up about that? <laughs> and, um, awesome numbers and congratulations to, um, to you know, the City of Greater Bendigo, Bendigo Art Gallery, Bendigo Tourism, all those um, uh, groups and, and the state government that supported this um, exhibition, I think ran from March to, to June. Well, uh, just uh, just awesome, and and who would have thought that there's so many um, Elvis fans still out there, uh, Chris? But uh, are we allowed? Are we allowed props on the show, Chris? Of course, what? of course. You mean beyond our moody blue backgrounds? <laughs> beyond our moody blue backgrounds. Did you get that one? Can we see? Can we see? Oh. <laughs> Oh, the, it's all it's all disappearing except for the picture of Elvis. It oh, makes me feel like my makes me feel like I've got a co-host in Elvis Presley. That's that's my GI Blues album. Oh wow! Well, I should say it's it's my mum's, <laughs> so Maureen, um, who um, I've I've um, I've taken it when I when I left home I, way back. I took it with me, but um, so yeah, we're still out there. Um, I think I was all of about eight when Elvis died in 1977. <laughs> But I've still got the um, the LP. <laughs> I know a former councillor who often watches or listens to this program, who's an Elvis Presley uh, tragic as well. 
uh, hello to you. I know you know who you are. Um, one of these days uh, in the not too distant future, Tony, uh, we're going to be having to explain to people who Elvis Presley was, and I'd uh, I'd sort of dread that time to be honest. That would be sad. The <laughs> yeah. No, fabulous. Well done to the team at Greater Bendigo. Uh, here's a few stories from uh, Interstate. A councillor across the border in Murray River Council has been convicted of assault, occasioning bodily harm. Has apologised for his behaviour and believes that he'll be able to remain on the council. According to media reports, the council is seeking advice on that matter. Um, I think there was a $1,000 fine uh, corrections order of 12 months or, or something to that effect, uh, Tony. If that was replicated this side of the border, would the councillor lose office as a result? Yeah, well, it would turn on um, the, well, it's the provisions of Section 34 of the Local Government Act, which have disqualification provisions. Um, and it turns on not what the actual sentence was, but what the uh, potential sentence might be. So um, mm. the rule in Victoria is that if you're convicted of an offence in the previous eight years, that's punishable upon the first conviction um, for a term of imprisonment for two or more years, then that's a disqualifying um, factor. So mm. I would think that um, assault uh, occasioning actual bodily harm probably um, potentially on a first offence could be could deliver a two year imprisonment. Mm. I, I, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but um, I, I do think it, it 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 would would come close to be a disqualifying offence mm. south of the Murray. So I guess it depends on how the legislation's worded in New South Wales, and we're not experts on that. So we'll we'll look at that one uh, with interest and wait to see what occurs. I'm sure some of, in fact, I know some of our Victorian councillors have interactions with councillors across the border, and many listening or watching to this are probably aware of those circumstances. The South Australian system's going through an overhaul. In fact, there's re there's reform happening uh, everywhere at the t at the at the moment. Tony Tasmania. Western Australia, which we'll come to in a moment, South Australia, a new Council of Code of Conduct Management Framework uh, came into effect last week, I think, and there's these new behavioural standards that are being applied and councils can top them up with additional expectations, as I understand it. Are you yeah. across this at all? Yeah, I, I did have a look at this, quite interesting. So there's, they're introducing a, a behavioural standards panel, not sort of mm. unlike our council of conduct panel process. It deals with complaints about, you know, behaviour of council members um, that can't be resolved at council level, so very similar to Victoria. But I did have a quick look at the behavioural standards that um, have been, you know, prescribed through the regulations there in, in South Australia, not unlike our behavioural standards here in Victoria under the local government governance and integrity regulations in that some of them are quite general, but I actually was taken by um, some of the more specific behavioural standards um, and probably drawing mm. on experience of states like Victoria. I actually thought that um, we in Victoria might, um, might potentially pick up on some of these because they seem to address some specific issues that we certainly have crop up in Victoria yeah. from time to time. So, for example, um, council members must, uh, when making public comments, including comments to the media on council decisions and council matters, show respect for others and clearly indicate their views are personal and not right. those of the council. Mm. Um, another one was a responsibility um, of a member of council to take all reasonable steps to provide accurate information to the community and the council and to ensure the council, sorry, that the community and the council is not knowingly misled. Mm. And then taking a step further, there's a requirement that they that a councillor take all reasonable and appropriate steps to correct the public record in circumstances where the councillor becomes aware that they have unintentionally misled the community or the council. I think that's, that's a really good, excellent provision yeah. um, because that issue does come up regularly from time to time at council. So we'll watch how, you know, that that plays out in terms of the um, compliance enforcement process there 
in um, in South Australia, but those um, behavioural standards were only published in the Government Gazette in SA a week or two ago. Yes. Those latter ones around unintentionally misleading and correcting the public record, we don't have anything that would be equivalent to that, do we? No, well, ours are much more general um, and and um, about, you know, and certainly they're about observing council policies as well, and you could... Yeah. Um, delve into most policies on councils and they would talk about the mayor being the spokesperson and such. But but I think that um, um, ours are, you know, a brave attempt to cover the area, but I, um, perhaps um, there's a, a general nature about ours, where, whereas the South Australian ones seem to also seek to address explicitly certain circumstances um, that perhaps aren't um, as obviously dealt with in the general language. Of mm. the That's really interesting. All right, we'll we'll watch that one closely. Uh, in Western Australia, as I mentioned, there's reforms happening there, and some councils are, are being asked to uh, to um, reduce the number of councillors and um, changes to ward structures, etc. And that's created a little bit of a situation that one mayor has described as bizarre in this last week. We're in the city of Albany. They have to conduct a by-election to replace a councillor who has died in office a couple of months ago, um, even though uh, four of the positions on that council are going going to be dispensed with in the not too distant future but this is a case of current legislation applying and uh, the reforms not yet being enacted that's right beautiful place albany but um um sadly councillor Alison good i think was passed away yes, was. sadly in august um it's it's in very a very small ward um about i think three to four thousand potential voters in all and um um I'm not saying that the voters in, in WA slack, uh, Chris, but last election, only um, only a third of the voters turned out to vote. So right. we're talking mm. about, you know, maybe 1,300 or so um, people actually exercising their democratic right here. Um, but, yes, you're right. It, it, it's, it's been explained by um, the local government minister in WA that um, under the existing provisions, despite the fact that, one of these councillors, the new councillor who's elected may well not sit in office or not for very long sit in office given the reforms. There's a necessity to hold this by election in mm. the meantime. At a cost of $16,000, they've estimated, which, uh, given what you've just said about the number of voters, might explain that cost. I thought that estimate seemed low. I think it yeah. would cost a lot more than that to run a by election. Uh, here. Um, I don't think, based on that, obviously com compulsory voting doesn't exist at the local government level in WA, like they've introduced in Tassie recently. Uh, or a lot of people are getting fined. A lot of people are getting fined would be the other, yes, the other side of that. I know you, uh, you've you recently been to WA mm -hmm. and uh, quite a few local government stories over there caught your eye at the time, didn't they? It's, it's the wild west in, in a lot of ways <laughs> out there and um, yeah, yeah I, was, I was quite amused. I think I might have been there during an election period yeah. but um yeah quite amused about some of the local signs and uh and the, and the articles in the local press but um anyway we'll 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 see um how many candidates put their hands up for um what might be a very short tenure yes um, as the albany as an Al city of albany ward councillor yes that'll be interesting isn't it if people actually look at it and think it's not even worth uh putting your hand up and they fail to get candidates but we're jumping ahead of ourselves there uh lots we could talk about tony uh we're probably running out of time so just very quickly uh scenic rim council in queensland uh it has just been it's just been announced this week that the state government is appointing an advisor to that council there's been lots of controversy over recent uh meetings and decisions and this is the equivalent of a municipal monitor in victoria being appointed to a council yeah yeah i must admit i didn't know where scenic room was but you informed me it's around bow desert i think you said so bow, that... bow desert i think is where the council office is yes yeah it's a sort of southern southeastern corner if you look the... at the map you've got the gold coast and the tambourine mountain that's on the other side of the mountain yeah oh, beautiful inland oh, yeah, yeah. It would be. David David Keenan, a former CEO in Victoria and a few roles uh, in uh, the northern states, has just recently been appointed there as the CEO. So uh, good time to be coming in there, uh, 
David. Uh, and uh, just a quick note, uh, a recent episode of the Local Government News Roundup that I uh, produced while I was away with Ian McCormick from Canada, we talked a bit about, I don't know if you heard this, Tony, this move towards strong mayor powers. It's happening in Canada. It's happening quite a bit in uh, in the UK at the moment as well, where uh, the mayor has more powers, even sort of operational type powers, can override council votes, etc., with a minimal level of support. There's some pushback happening in Toronto, uh, as we, has been reported this week, where three newly ele elected councillors are actively opposing this uh, move to introduce new powers for the mayor. Yeah, for, firstly, such a relief um, um, knowing this is actually about local government Government because when I saw it on your suggested list of items, we talk about Chris. I just thought it was a ploy for you to, you know, do the um, lumberjack song from <laughs> Monty Python. But I did go and look it up, and um, you're right. It's the provincial government of Ontario who's introduced um, these uh, stronger powers for mayors in in uh, Ottawa and Toronto, uh, mm. are the, the two major cities. Um, mm. And the rationale appears to be that they say, look, we've got this housing crisis in these major cities and um, the mayors need these stronger powers in order to basically... If, um, cut the red bring, tape. Yeah, cut yeah. through the red tape, mm. with, with, particularly with bylaws, apparently, to be, um, to be able to deal with this. So um, interesting, there's obviously, you know, that, that backlash from um, at least some of the councillors and... Um, and um, there's a provision where, you know, uh, there can be uh, um, an overturning, but it requires some sort of absolute majority rather than mm. just a, a simple majority. Mm. One to watch uh, with interest. And uh, I recommend if you're interested in those happenings in Canada that you check out that episode of the Roundup with uh, Ian McCormick from October. Tony, I think that's probably all we can do for this week. Thank you so much for stepping in and providing your thoughts on all of those stories. Another very interesting week in the world of local government. Real pleasure. And uh, thanks to you and the viewers. Uh, and um, someone else will be back next week with um, to, do, to basically dissect the, the week's news. We do have a guest co-host lined up. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll spring them on you on our program next week. Thank you, Tony. Have a great week. Thanks, Chris. That's Tony Rownich from Hunt & Hunt Lawyers, who are our terrific sponsors here on the Governance Update from VLGA Connect. Thanks for listening and watching. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.